from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Robert Kasnick. I'm the Associate Register of Copyrights for the United States Copyright Office and the Director of Registration Policy and Practices. And in that position, I oversee uh, approximately 150 uh, Library of Congress employees who are the examiners of registration specialists who register all claims of copyright that come into the Copyright Office to protect uh, those works. I have uh, the honor of introducing one of the co-editors uh, of the book that we will be discussing now. I'm sure uh, this is going to be a wonderful discussion. We have with us today uh, Daniel DeSimone, who is curator of the Lessing J. Rosenwald collection. He was going to be joined by his co-editor, John Hessler, who is curator of the J.I. Kislik collection in the Library of Congress. Uh, but unfortunately, John could not join us today, and Daniel will say something about that. So Daniel is the co-editor of Galileo Galilei, The Starry Messenger. And with that, I will turn it over to Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming today. And uh, it's very nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, I'd like to thank all the staff members who uh, are helping put this program on today. Uh, they give their time, and it's really wonderful to see so many orange shirts and I'm uh, proud to be representing the library in their name. Um, what I would like to talk to you, to, to you about today is a book. And we, uh, the book is by Galileo, and it's, the title of it is Sidereus Nuncius. And I'd like to tell the story of why this book, why I'm here today, and why this book is important. And um, it's a book that the Library of Congress now owns. And it's a book that has really transformed much of modern science. Starry Messenger, or the Sidereus Nuncius, is a 68-page book that was printed in Venice in 1610. Very commonplace in its appearance, uh, printed with, uh, with a Roman type and bound uh, in a, a paste paper board. Very common looking, has some illustrations in it. But there's nothing extraordinary about the publication itself. But what was the, the contents of this uh, book revolutionized science. Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm a bibliographer. I'm a historian of the book. John Hessler, who was supposed to be here today, had emergency uh, dental surgery. And he wrote me and said, I can't pronounce the letters S or F. So I won't be there today. So I'm, I'm going to try and provide some information on the science. Um, but mostly tell the story of the book. What Galileo did in 1610 was he printed this book and he did four remarkable things. First of all, it was the first book to use a scientific instrument to study the heavens. And this was the use of the telescope. And the telescope that he, he didn't invent the telescope, but he took the elements of its construction and he increased the power, um, uh, the capacity to be able to view the, the, view the heavens. And so it was a very important advancement in the use of scientific instruments in the study of natural history. What he was able to do is he was able to view the moon in such a way as he was able to make an identification that, that, that showed that the, the moon had substance similar to the earth. Um, in history, uh, the, the whole concept of the moon is that it was actually an ether and it had no physical components that were similar to the, the Earth. But his book, and through his observations, he was able to, um, um, to be able to demonstrate that the moon had substance. He was also, in his observation, he identified the Milky Way, which is our solar system. And through observation and through the records that he kept and the data which then he, he had printed, he was able to show that there's a solar system that the Earth is part of. 
and that he didn't at that time say that the Earth was the center. He didn't challenge the, the, um, uh, the uh, climate of opinion on that score, but he made it obvious that the, the Earth was part of a much grander um, solar system. And the fourth thing that he did with this book was that he discovered the moons of Jupiter. Now, on, on his, um, on first sight, that may, may not be so important, but he was able to view Jupiter and he was able to show that there were moons that were circular, circular uh, that were um, uh, circulating around the planet and that it showed motion. And this was important because the whole concept of science was that the celestial world was static and it was perfect. It was immutable. And now, through his observations, Galileo demonstrated that there was actually motion in the celestial area. And this was extremely important, obviously, and had enormous impact on, um, on future scientific studies. So this is what Galileo uh, did with this small 68-page um, uh, pamphlet that was published in Venice in 1610. Now, until 2008, the Library of Congress did not own a copy of the Sidereus Nuncius. We have many, many of uh, Galileo's titles, um, but this book was elusive to us. And so it was, it was part of our desiderata. It was ev all the curators in the library were aware that the library needed or wanted to be able to find a copy of this and to be able to add it to our extraordinary collections of, uh, of, um, of astronomy. And in 2008, I was attending a book fair in New York City, and I was walking through looking. I was talking with booksellers, and we were looking at various books we we're hoping to add to our collections. And I walked by a booth, and in a glass case, there was a copy of the Sidereus Nuncius. And uh, I looked at it through the case, and uh, I, I, at first I just said, oh, no, we, we will never be able to buy this book. It's just, it's just too important, it's too expensive, we're not going to be able to buy the book. And I walked away. And about two minutes later, I said to myself, you jerk, you've got to go look at this book. This is an extraordinary opportunity to be able to see a copy of the Sidereus Nuncius that's in the marketplace. And so I did, I went back and I told the bookseller who I was, I introduced myself and I said, can I look at the book? And he handed me a, uh, the copy of the book and it was an extremely large copy. And it was in a contemporary binding, which means that it was in a paste paper board that a publisher would have put on the book just to preserve it. In those days, in the 17th century, most books were printed, and then a person would buy it, and they'd send it to his binder, and then they would bind it up. But in this case, it just had this modest paper binding around it. And it, it was one of those books that uh, just actually sent thrills through my hands because I knew that I was touching an extraordinary copy of the book. So I thanked the bookseller, came back to, uh, came back to New York, uh, from New York. I talked to my boss and we were very excited about the fact that we had seen this book. And about two or three months later, the call came down from the associate librarian's office that they were looking for extraordinary opportunities for the library to find materials to add to our collections. So we decided to write up a recommendation um, for purchase. And we sent it up to the uh, associate librarian's office. And to our surprise, she asked to have an appointment. So we went and we talked with her. And we talked to her about this book. And my boss and I had put together this elaborate sales pitch that we were going to make about the book. And we had, uh, we had papers and we had charts. And we were going to really press her on this. And we're sitting in the meeting and we we were, began our uh, discussion of the book, and she said, I know the book. Two weeks earlier, she had been at Stanford, and the book that they showed her when they were, she was in the science department was a Sidereus Nuncius. So she was prepared for this, and it was just a, a, a very lucky series of events that brought us to, uh, to be able to pursue the purchase of the book. So she gave us authorization to, uh, um, to uh, do our research to be able to potentially buy the book. So we called the bookseller, and the bookseller was in Paris, and he sent us the book 
on approval so that we could bring it in and we could show it to our uh, members of our conservation staff so that we could we can analyze the paper other bibliographers at the library took a look at it so that we were able to build up a um, um, sort of a body of information on purchasing such an important book for the library and uh, as part of that process I took the copy to Harvard University to examine the copies that were at Harvard and Harvard had three uh, three copies of the book and I called um, a scientist by the name of um, Owen Gingrich, who's associated with Harvard University, and he invited me up. He set up the appointments, and we were able to, to compare this extraordinary copy with the copies at Harvard. And one of the things that we found, and this is why this copy was so important to the Library of Congress, was that this copy was printed in such a way as it was uncut. There was no the deckled edges, the original paper was exactly the size uh, as it was when Galileo printed the book. And why this was important, because when he was talking about his little chapter on the, on the, um, the Milky Way, he did a series of char star charts to show the expanse of the Milky Way. And the, and the charts took up two, sh two sheets of paper, complete, top to bottom, and so you had these little uh, points of light, or points of, uh, which indicated the nature of, the, of the, uh, the Milky Way. And when we went and we looked at the Harvard copies, all three copies had been trimmed over time by a binder, by various binders. And so they were in fact incomplete. They didn't show the type of information that was important uh, to having the real view of what Galileo saw when he was looking through his telescope in January and February of uh, 1610. There was another copy that was at Wellesley College and Owen Gingrich made an introduction for me there and I was able to bring our copy and they had a near perfect copy. So I was able to examine and compare the, uh, th this copy with the copy that it was Wellesley at Wellesley College and, to be, be, and I could see what, how important it was to have a copy that had such um, um, uncut edges. And in addition to that, it was bound in this very modest way. So it was, it was an original book, obviously a book that uh, Galileo had handled at some point and that it was saved um, in a very um, simple manner but was perfect for uh, our, our uses at the library because it showed you could, you could see the original binding and you could see the sewing that was done and you could see so much about the way this book was produced in, uh, in 1610. Uh, in addition to, to dealing with Owen Gingrich, we had a couple other scholars, uh, bibliographers who came in and examined the copy and helped us determine that this was a copy that the library should purchase. And ultimately, we were successful in, uh, in, um, in purchasing the book. And it was a real, uh, a real thrill for our, our division, certainly. I'm in the Rare Book and Special Collections Division to be able to make such a, an important contribution. And the library was very happy to have it because it filled a very important hole that was in our collections of science. And um, in fact, since uh, that time, we've been able to, to find a few other items that we've been able to add. So it's been a very important event uh, for our division and for the library itself. Once we had possession of the book, we decided that we need to really make a kind of an announcement about the purchase. So we organized a symposium. And the symposium um, which, was, which took place in, um, I think it was November 2010, included a number of international, national and inter international scholars who were, um, uh, were going to deliver papers, various aspects of the Galileo production, and, um, and then we were going to print a, uh, a, an edition of the, of the proceedings. And so uh, in November 2010, um, I made a presentation which basically described the presentation or the, the, how we purchased the book and why it was uh, such an important copy. And then uh, John Hessler, who I'm sorry is not here today, um, just John Hessler spoke about uh, Galileo and his relationship to Ari Aristotelian logic and how he used Aristotelian methodology when he was making his observations. And David Marshall Miller also spoke about Galileo's relationship with 
with, um, with Aristotle, but looking at it from a philosophical point of view and how uh, Aristotelian philosophy was going to be changed as a result of Galileo's observations. Paul Needham, who's at the Scheide Library in, um, at Princeton University, came down and he talked about making the book. What was it like for Galileo, who in, who in uh, J January of 1610 recognized what his notations that he was making, the types of information that he was recording. And, and he talked about how Galileo was so excited because he wanted to get this book in print. He, w he knew that there was other people that may be seeing the same things in the skies. So as we examine the copy that we have, we can almost see Galileo rushing through with the printer to be able to produce a, uh, his book before competition. May have, uh, may have done this. And you can see it in the way the type was set. You can see it in the way the illustrations were set unevenly, on a, and in some cases on top of one another. They were trying to get this book out. So Needham, who's one of the great bibliographers working in the United States today, gave a very important presentation on the nature of the book, about the paper, the qualities of paper, about the type and the nature of the type that was being, that was being, um, that was used by Galileo. In, in the production of this book. And Eileen Reeves, who's also at Princeton, she looked at tel uh, uh, Galileo's telescope, and she's in the Department of Comparative Literature at, uh, at Princeton. And what she saw, she saw musical instruments. She saw that this, this pipe, which had these lenses in it, looked very similar to the trumpets that were being used in, in late Renaissance music. And she, she made an essay which compared the pipes that were used, the quality of the pipes that were being used in, um, uh, in musical instruments and in organs, and then made this wonderful juxtaposition with the, uh, with the pipe that Galileo was using to, to view the universe. And it was a very interesting and uh, original piece of uh, research uh, that she was able to present. And then Peter Mockamer, who, uh, is at the University of Pittsburgh, who's one of the deans of Galileo studies. And actually, the fact that he was willing to come and to be able to participate was very important for us. He did a very important uh, encapsulation of the program by showing how uh, Galileo studies and, and the impact of Galileo, which took place in between 1610 and 1632 when he was out, uh, finally um, uh, condemned by the, the Inquisition. The impact in, uh, of that transition in the study of science and its relationship to religion and how that has progressed through the centuries and how in fact it's, it's still an important issue as we, uh, as we grapple with this, with this uh, uh, dichotomy between science and religion. And so we had this fabulous program. We had a very good turnout and then we decided that we wanted to produce a, a, a book that would, that would record the history of this copy, this important book. And we had this relationship, John Hessler had the relationship with, with a company called Levenger Press. And the, uh, the editor from, from Leven, Le, uh, Levenger Press, Mim Harrison, who's here actually today, um, Mim got very excited about this because she's with, with this press, they're trying to make this, uh, this combination of, of very fine publications, but also scholarly publications. She's not just interested in producing a coffee table book, but she's looking for a book with content. And so we discussed how, what type of report do we want? And we thought that because our copy, the, the LC copy, is so extraordinary, that we wanted to have an exact facsimile of, the, of this copy of the Galileo in this book. And so we, we took great pains to digitize the book and to make sure that the book had an exact size because the size of this copy was so important that we wanted this facsimile to be an exact size. And we then got a translation by Albert um, Va Van Helden, uh, who had published a translation of Galileo's text from Italian into English. And it's part of a, a publication that was put out by the Chicago University Press. And uh, he graciously allowed us uh, to use his text so that we had the facsimile of the original edition printed by Galileo. Then we had the, uh, the Van, Hel uh, Van Helden translation. 
as part, as part two. And then we had the series of six essays that were a part of the, um, of the symposium that, um, uh, that became part of this book. So that we have this wonderful package that we were able to produce representing the library and, and uh, the library's collections. And uh, we, we're, very in, we're very happy with the production of the book. And it's going to be, I think it's issued tomorrow or today. Um, I know there, there are copies that are, that are um, um, in one of the booths. But it's, it's just a very exciting um, opportunity for us. And I think that we're very, very happy. It's very, it's very unusual for people who are working on a book to get everything they want. But in this case, we did. We were able to get the facsimile. We were able to get the translation. All our authors got their essays in on time. They were edited um, uh, very well by, by Mim Harrison. And then we had a production team at the Levenger Press who produced a very important and beautiful book for us. So um, uh, this is what, why this book is important to us, why it's important to the library. And we feel that as a scholarly piece, that it's going to have legs over time because of the authors who pre presented it. Now, I, I know it's a little early, um, but because John Hessler's not here and he was going to produce or to talk about all the scientific aspects of the book, um, uh, this, my speech is going to end here. But if there's any questions that I think I can handle, I'd uh, be more than happy to, uh, uh, to, to entertain them. Yes, sir. Well, I'm sorry I missed the uh, symposium. Uh three years ago, but uh, since you're the curator of the Rosenwald collection in the library, um, I wouldn't mind being brought up to speed on that because I've heard of the Rosenwald collection at the National Gallery, which is a really great print yep. collection. Well, when Lessing Rosenwald made his gift to the, to the nation, it was a gift in two parts. One was the gift of prints which went to the National Gallery of Art, about 22,000 prints, and his archive. And then the book collection came to the Library of Congress. So he split his collection with all the rare books which cover six centuries of the graphic arts, and then the old master prints that went to the National Gallery. Now, therefore, he created a center for the graphic arts in Washington, D.C., which is the most important in the country. Just one gift. Um, by, uh, by an individual that had a, uh, had a vision. And um, so that's really what... Uh, now, the, the, the book that we purchased, the Galileo, is part of the Rare Book and Special Collections division. It's not part of Rosenwald. Um, but I had the good fortune to be able to, uh, uh, to find the book and then to, to sort of shepherd it through the process. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I was able to purchase a copy of the book Friday at Library of Congress Bookshop. Oh, great. And it is stunningly beautiful, and, and it's, the book itself is a work of art. It is. You tell in it about taking the book up to Massachusetts in a briefcase in your lap, and as I was reading that, my hair was just sort of standing yep. on end. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how it felt to be carrying this important book around with you. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a funny story, because the bookseller, when the bookseller sent us the book on approval, which means that we have the right to be able to look at the book, but don't, uh, we're not purchasing it, and the uh, title does not pass. Well, part of the stipulation was that he had to insure it. And so we, we, um, uh, 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 we contacted the people at Harvard, and we got permission to be able to fly uh, to Massachusetts, and I was carrying the book in my briefcase. And uh, it, was, it was a very special... Uh, it was a very special feeling because I knew that I was, I knew that I had one of the most important, it, it's the most important book that I will ever be involved with the purchase of. There's no question about that. But I also knew that bibliographically this book had all the attributes uh, that are important to an institution like ours because when we're teaching, which we do a lot of, we want to be able to show the best possible um, um, book that we can. And that's, so it's very important to us. But that feeling of, of going in, it was a funny thing, too, because I was waiting in the airport, and Nancy Pelosi uh, was in the airport at the same time. And so uh, I was able to wave to her. That was really thrilling, too. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned Owen Gingerich, uh, who wrote the book about Copernicus trying to find his book, and you mentioned the printing history of how many copies there were of, of that. With Galileo's Starry Messenger, what was the printing history? How many copies? Yeah. You found one out of how many? Yeah, there's, uh, there's 168 copies of the, uh, of the original 1610 edition. Now, Paul Needham did a census of all the copies, not only in the United States, but in European libraries. And he did a bibliographical description, short bibliographical description, so that we know what copy-specific information is. It's about the Library of Congress copy, the Wellesley copy, the two copies at Harvard. And of the 168 copies, there's only 17 that are complete. So we're pretty happy about that. Yes, sir. Was the uh, bookseller able to tell you anything of the history of, the, of their particular copy? Did they know the, what they had? Or that, just any, any of, of the, the history, who had had it, where they got it? Well, we have all that provenance information, yes. That was a very important part of our purchasing. Um, the bookseller, uh, there was a partnership, a bookseller in Paris and a bookseller in New York. They owned the copy together, and they purchased the copy in France from a very old li uh, family. Um, and so that we knew where the copy was, we knew how long it was in France, and that was important, obviously, for us. And um, the booksellers understood that, and when we, when we were negotiating with them, they were able to provide us with documentation um, which not only, uh, which confirmed all the uh, um, uh, provenance issues that we needed, uh, we needed confirmed. Does that answer your question? A question, could you uh, comment a little further about to what extent Galileo himself was involved in publishing and printing the book? And yeah. Uh, did he so actually handle the press? This is, uh, this is Galileo's third book. His first book was published in 1606, and it was called the Compasso, which was a book of measurement that was used for actually as a military book to show uh, ballistics. It was a study of ballistics. That was his first book. He had that book printed in his house. In the imprint, it was, it was Galileo, Galileo, La Casa de Mille, uh, 1606. In, the, in, the, in this book, his third, this, his third book, it was printed by a Venetian publisher by, publisher by the name of Bellioni, Tommaso Bellioni. And, but Galileo was involved in the whole process, and we know that because the book was not printed continuously. It wasn't printed from sort of the first page of text all the way through to page 68. And uh, he printed it in sections. When he finished a section, he would have it printed. And we know that because of the signatures in the book, the, um, uh, the bibliographical information provided by the printer, we could see how it was assembled. And we could see also there was different paper stocks. If it had been printed continuously or consecutively, then it would have been the same pr printer stock. Uh, paper stock. So in January, in January of 1610, he printed part of it, and then he and then there was another printing um, in February, and then he finished it in the middle of March of 1610. And and all that evidence is there. In our copy, actually, there are, are fingerprints um, from the printer that appear on one of the lower margins, and we swear it's Galileo's hand, but uh, we we're not going to do a DNA test. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, and thank you for coming. You've been a great audience. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.